Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this public lecture number one from our series with DMU. Um, I'm happy that you're here. I hope that you're going to gain much from today's talk. We have a very special speaker today who is very knowledgeable in material science. And today's talk is entitled A Sustainable Material past, present, and future. So our speaker today is Professor Shashi Paul from DMU. So Professor Shashi is a professor in nanoscience and nanotechnology and works for Emerging Technologies Research Center. He graduated from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, India and has previously worked at the Cambridge University, Durham, and Rutgers University. His research interests are in manufacturing and the analysis of nanomaterials and their application into energy, electronics, and biological sensors. He has a specific focus on the development of materials manufacturing processes to reduce the carbon footprint and next generation electronic devices. So he's very involved in contemporary sciences. He has, he is very well published and has published on materials like polymer electronic memory devices, selenium nanoparticles, electrical bi-stability bi mechanisms in polymer memory devices. And he teaches modules like emerging materials and processes, energy conversion and storage systems, as well as physics of semiconductor devices. So needless to say, we have a specialist in materials today, and very specifically in electronics-based materials today. So I want to welcome on stage Professor Shashi. Hello. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Good morning to you, Professor. Good morning, Kathleen, and good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, good morning, if you are in uh, the place where I work. Okay. So, Professor, I'm just a little bit curious. Uh, since when have you been interested in materials? I think uh, um, uh, my interest um, in material, material, material science um, kind of uh, evolved when I was second year undergraduate student. So I met somebody uh, who worked, I think, over 10 years in NASA and, wow. um, and showed some interesting properties of material, which I was not aware of. Uh, I was BNG electrical and electronic student, so nothing to do with materials. And then uh, I had opportunity to, once I finished my first degree, uh, had opportunity to um, develop myself into condensed matter and experimental uh, condensed matter physics. So since then, um, well, you will find out if th that interest is still there at the end of the talk or not. Okay. Uh, do you think that a lot of our problems, current day problems can be solved with material science? I think uh, when like my, I work in a very tiny, part of the you know total material so if you think about material whether we think about medicines or clothes or you know building um, building materials or even what we are having as well and that is also material so so material is a you know very um uh, is a wide field right say so i think uh, i work in a very maybe point zero zero one percent of that so i think i can uh, with my little experience i can share what are uh, you know the, the, the what are the possibilities uh, which we can explore um, to save some of the problems such as carbon footprints? All right, okay. Can't wait to hear more from you, Professor. So the stage is yours. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, I think I'll start um, again. And and I'm sure. Um, I guess you can see my slides. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you, Jacqueline. And I think I would also like to extend my real gratitude to APU to give me this opportunity um, say, uh, to share some of 
um, our work, I don't want to call my work because a lot of people involved in it from undergraduate um, level to PhD and my fellow members who are working with me tirelessly or some of them probably more than me. So um, again, um, I'll probably um, going to keep my talk um, at, you know, very simple. Um, as Jacqueline advised me that um, people um, listening to my talk from very diverse background. However, if you are um, a semiconductor uh, expert, uh, you will may find some of um, the, the slides very mundane, mundane to you or, you know, it's not, it's maybe uh, at pitched at undergraduate level or at school level. And you can please excuse me on that. So, okay, so I think um, I just would like to give you um, a structure of my talk. Uh, first of silicon and a little bit of background and discovery. Um, and of course, there is always um, uh, a you know, fight who discovers silicon first or second or third. But at the end, uh, I think this issue is settled. Uh, and, um, and I think another question uh, probably I will try to address um, in this uh, my um, um, and our presentation, why silicon still dominates electronic industry, say, so that uh, we look through that as well. Um, and then uh, Jacqueline um, said that can we solve some of the problems uh, using material. So we still use silicon uh, and we have some um, current manufacturing methods. Um, are they still suitable uh, in the present context? Uh, for example, um, they may contribute uh, to uh, greenhouse gases or, or carbon footprint. So we will look into those as well. Um, and then, uh, of course, um, some of the method by which silicon is manufactured is probably um, um, 70, 80 years old, uh, modified, improved, but they're still very old. So the next question um, we will be addressing, are there alternative processes or alternative uh, method uh, which can be explored uh, to make silicon? Maybe not necessarily everything um, be crystal, but there may be some part of um, silicon uh, which we can uh, actually address with, with some of the method. Um, some are exploratory and some are around for a while. Okay, so um, at, at, at De Montfort University, um, I think um, I need to uh, articulate my work and share my work or my, my colleagues' work with you all. Um, so we have um, developed a process uh, which we call a raw process named after um, Egyptian ancient sun god. So of course there is a story behind it, why we named it as a raw process. So then um, again, um, I did say that, you know, present and the past, I mean, Bob will go through uh, some of the discovery of silicon, uh, present, uh, where we stand uh, at the moment and the future. So, um, say, as you probably know that, um, you know, nanotechnology um, is, is coming in a big way. Uh, however, uh, if you take same silicon, um, reduce into few nanometer or sub nanometer, so it's various electrical and optical properties they change. So, so those, those those properties we can explore um, to um, gain benefit, for example, uh, to trap either light uh, or, 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 or trap a lot of wavelengths of light and, and hence you can make a solar cell of higher energy uh, efficiency. So, so um, again, um, I think, uh, uh, we are aware of various uh, renewable energy um, re resources uh, or way or appliances, so to call photovoltaic or wind energy. Uh, at the end, uh, when we create um, that very energy, we store, especially the electrical one, uh, we store in battery. So uh, batteries also um, at the verge of um, a big evolution. So we are doing some work um, on um, lithium and old battery. So, so in my uh, presentation, um, I will only touch upon um, uh, three applications uh, which we are exploring at DMU. So solar cell, uh, anode um, uh, for lithium ion batteries, and then um, electronic uh, memory devices. 
uh, but we have just started now exploring silicon into a neuromotory memory as well. Okay. And then finally, um, I will summarize uh, what we discussed. Okay. I think um, um, Jacqueline um, already given, you know, fair um, background of my career. And I thought um, I put this graph and, um, and show you a bit of the, 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 um, the travel I had in my so far a career. So I just want to say um, I was born in India, um, uh, which is the northern state, uh, somewhere of, um, just just uh, under the, the Himalayas. So it's a very cold in winter uh, and very hot in summer. Say so, so it's interesting. So I survived. Um, so probably I'll continue to survive. Say say I won there, and then I had opportunity. Uh, to learn um, a place called Indian Institute, Indian Institute of Science. And I think um, um, I have to first de-learn, but I've learned a bit once I enter there. And then uh, I think there is a culture um, which pushes you uh, to, to at least learn to the level where um, and you start um, doubting yourself that you need to, you, you don't understand many things. I, so that, um, opportunity is one of the most wonderful and transforming, transforming in my life. So, so after that, um, I went to a similar place um, in this country uh, called Cambridge, and then I had also opportunity to work uh, up in the north at Durham University. So, then I had a short sprint um, across the Atlantic, around 14 months, I think. So I worked there, um, and, and then finally. Um, I came to um, England uh, in 2004, uh, uh, Demont for University Leicester. So I'm sure many of you are aware of um, Leicester Football Club. Um, we also have a rugby club in Leicester. And I think um, a couple of years ago, Leicester was also in news uh, because we found uh, remains of King Richard III. So, so uh, Leicester is not very far. Um, from London, um, it takes slightly over an hour uh, by train um, and the direct train if you ever want to visit. And it's also um, a city uh, of various cultures um, and of course, various uh, cuisines. So, so, so if you ever come to Leicester, uh, I can uh, give you some tips of the best restaurant uh, uh, in the city. Okay, so um, I think um, um, I joined Emerging Technology Research Center in 2004. Um, just want to give you a um, very uh, a quick overview. It was established in 1996, and we were three members that time. Uh, and accidentally, uh, three of the members uh, associated with Indian Institute of Science, uh, as well as Cambridge. So, so. Um, uh, but we have expanded now a bit. Um, so we have now around, um, I'll share with you, we have uh, more members um, in MTurk. Say. So again, I, I don't want to bore you with these uh, details. Say. So most of our, um, um, most of us, we are such active and deliver, you know, international um, as speeches at international conferences, organize journals, and, and various other stuff as well. Uh, but I think uh, um, our main focus was um, training a really um, you know, bright young minds um, um, and training um, into very uh, topical areas. So, so we, we, we had all, most of the time had um, around 20 to 30 uh, PhD stu student um, hosted uh, in the center. So now many of them, uh, they are working in a number of um, good uh, in, you know, institutions, either research related or um, industry or academic say, institutions as well. So, so we have wonderful um, facilities, a research facility, which I will share uh, once I finish uh, my talk. Say again, to carry out research, um, it's not possible uh, without funding. So we were just fortunate. Um, we we over for the last two decade, uh, we had um, 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 uh, success uh, in obtaining uh, competitive external funding. So 
again, um, I think uh, not to go through each point. So, so we work in materials uh, and 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 various devices, um, and and also uh, emerging um, devices. So, for example, um, some of my colleagues uh, they work in a printable electronics or, or electronics, which is which they term as green, uh, so that um, even some people dispose to environment. So, so, so these devices cause very least impact to the environment and, and other um, uh, people are working on a power electronics, uh, especially um, gallium um, oxide is, is a new uh, exploratory material uh, which has uh, much more uh, benefit than silicon carbide or gallium nitride. So, so those kind of um, uh, materials uh, we are working uh, in our center. Okay, so our team, um, so we have um, around uh, five academics, we have a technical sports, uh, PhD student, and we all, always host a large uh, number of UG and, and, and PG project students. Uh, so they are all a part of um, um, our team and they all contribute what I'm going to share uh, here uh, with you all. So now, um, going so that's a little bit I think background about um, um, the work in the center, what is going on, uh, and then uh, now I'm going to begin uh, on a silicon. Say so, uh, a year ago, um, somehow I don't know how um, I came across this book called um, Ten Materials That Shaped uh, Our World uh, by Grant Norton. Say so, so um, um, uh, I was curious. Um, I think um, uh, since my childhood, I learned that uh, books uh, or maybe the only uh, companion which um, stay with you. So um, I got this book and, and uh, it's very engaging. It was very interesting. It, it was quite um, um, covered a lot of history uh, behind these materials. So, so um, Norton um, um, iterated um, or articulated uh, these um, uh, ten materials, and one of them was silicon. So, so silicon uh, he termed this material a uh, material of information. So, um, uh, this you will soon uh, find yes, the, this silicon uh, we use uh, for you know um, cell phones. You, uh, at the moment, what you are, um, if you're seeing these slides or seeing my face, it's all happened um, through silicon. So yes, information technology, it has contributed a lot, uh, but it's also, if you are using a photovoltaic cell um, um, or a farm, you're seeing around you, uh, most 90, 90 over 90% um, solar cell, uh, which convert light uh, into electricity, they are also made of silicon. So silicon is not only um, um, important uh, from information um, um, technology point of view, but it's also important um, from um, energy conversion as well. Okay, so that was an experiment <laughs> to just say that if you just uh, take away, um, um, you know, a Pentium chip or, or processor from your computer, uh, that is what is going to happen. So we are going to hold. Okay, and and that is why the silicon is is so important. It's not only the way um, we are communicating today by you know mobile phone or you. Uh, I'm delivering the speech. We are entirely at different um, ge geographical locations. We can interact with each other, listen to each other, but think about you know trains, aeroplanes, you name it. So so silicon. Is almost everywhere, and it it, it it changed even our behavior, the way we work or react. So now, um, why um kind of silicon uh, is become uh, popular? So I think I'm going to address this question uh, in the next couple of um, slides. So first of all, um, if we uh, think about um crust um of, of silicon, um, it's the crust of Earth. Uh, just a minute, say. Okay. 
sorry, something happened. So, okay, so I think um, if if we, we just, just for the next couple of minutes, we are going to a little bit justify why um, silicon um, become more attractive, uh, why it been used. So, so if we um, um, try to um, um, uh, identify a material in Earth's crust. So what is Earth's crust? So if you think what well, this is Earth, let's just spherical uh, kind of a body, and then you take a point on the surface, you go approximately 70 kilometer in, that is crust. Okay, so in this crust, in that very crust, you have distribution um, of this material or percentage of this material. So oxygen, uh, obviously, uh, not just trapped, but reacted with various uh, other um, elements. So it's around um, 47%. And silicon is um, around 27%. So that is it's, it's abundant. So it's quite a lot compared to uh, various other uh, materials. So, so, so that is the one um, argument. And, uh, and then um, when you uh, think about silicon, uh, silicon uh, doesn't um, appear as an element as a as an element um, in in uh, Earth's crust. So it is always form uh, some sort of a compound. For example, silica or silicate. So um, when we say uh, oxide compound um, silica, so I think um, almost all of us um, have may have a touch sand. Sand, right? Say so sand um, is a common um, form of um, silicon dioxide. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other stuff in the sand, but there is uh, silicon dioxide quartz, um, rock crystal, amethyst, and, and various other things. Um, and they, we call them uh, oxides. And then uh, we also have silicate um, like asbestos, uh, granite, and hornblends, and all those things. Uh, they also contain silicon. So silicon is not in its purest form, and it comes uh, as a compound. So, so there are no ways by which we can um, uh, dissociate uh, silicon from these compounds. So, okay, so um, I don't want to indulge in this discussion. Um, I, I think uh, there is always um, um, uh, various stories related to that who um, isolated silicon uh, from its compound uh, for the first time. But I think um, probably this story is now um, you know, there is a consensus uh, now that a gentleman, um, is a chem he was chemist, Johns Jacob um, uh, Brazilius of Stockholm uh, in uh, 1824, um, isolated uh, silicon uh, from a, its, let's say, call it ores. Okay. So again, uh, silicon combined very uh, readily uh, with things like oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, phosphorus, um, and it exists in two uh, allotropic, fo allotropic forms. So one is amorphous um, a silicon, which has also some application, and, um, and another is a crystalline, and crystalline, the single crystal, um, um, is used uh, to make all those electronics devices, including uh, a processor uh, in your um, uh, laptop or in the computer, say. Yeah. So, um, there are uh, now wide uh, application of silicon. Silicon is not only used uh, to make um, um, chips or, or integrated circuits. So there are many uh, other applications. So it can um, uh, can make one can make alloy like you know ferrocene, called ferrocene. Uh, it is a um, alloy uh, uh, made from silicon and iron, and it has various applications, even in electronics, dynamo, and, and various other things. And then, of course, um, it, it can, uh, we also can use glass, glass, the window glass, it's just probably, it's, it's also made, um, there's a silicon in it. And, and then uh, we can also convert silicon into silicon carbide and silicon nitride. Of course, they've been used in electronic industry but there are also very hard materials. So, uh, in where, um, like for example, they can use uh, they can be used for travelogical applications. So, however, uh, my focus today uh, for the next half an hour is to only talk about um, a bit its application in electronics.
Okay, so I'm sure in schools, um, when we were at GCSE level or on 14, 15, um, we come across um, something called uh, conductors, uh, semiconductors, and insulators. So, so I have taken this 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 diagram uh, from um, Britannia. Um, uh, it's it's online uh, available. If you would like to download, you wish to don't you can download. Say so. What 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 I'm trying to show in this diagram is something uh, pretty simple. So if, if you I'm sitting in my room. So if I pick up a few things, um, for example, I can pick up my watch. It's leather. So probably this leather is uh, insulated, and uh, there's some kind of atom attached with these uh, metallic sticks. So these metallic conductors, they're conductors. And this wood is probably, um, or probably it is, um, it is insulator. So, so if we, you know, select all these materials, so so we can actually broadly categorize these materials into three uh, categories. Um, uh, generally, two in my office because semiconductors are not sit, they're not sitting in my office, uh, except in the computer or in my mobile phone. So. So you can um, broadly, uh, you know, select these material and, and, and identify some of them a conductor, meaning the electricity can um, pass through or current can pass through it and insulator. So generally they oppose uh, passing of current through them. Okay. So there is a, there is a demi um, material or semi material uh, from electrical conductivity point of view. And that is what we call semiconductor. So if you notice in the next slide, you will see that um, when we talk about activity is 10 to power minus 8. It means they are very, very low register material. So if you think about um, insulator, the order 10 is to power 12. So it's, it's a big number. And then semiconductors, uh, their register is approximately um, well, between um, uh, metals and and semiconductor um, in, in in insulator the order of 10 raised to the power minus 2 10 raised to the power minus 3 something of that order so that number is important to remember okay so um now the the idea about the evolution of the semiconductor device happened um so why i actually spoke about a, a resistivity the reason uh, you will actually a decipher from this slide. So if you think about um, metals or, or insulator, um, you can do any process on, on, on them. So you can't significantly change the resistivity. Okay, so they're pretty much set. I mean, I'm not saying that you can't change the word significantly, you can't change it significantly. But contrary to that, that um, we can change um, the resistivity of semiconductor material um, order of four to five magnitude. So why? So it's, it's pretty um, simple um, to understand. Uh, say, so if we think about silicon, um, silicon is a kind of um, tetravalent uh, bonding. So it means that if you think about, let's say this is a, a silicon atoms, so four atoms around it is a bond. So generally these bonds are covalent, it means they are very strong bond, they hold um, they, they, they held with a um, quite um, attractive forces. So in theory, so these electrons are paired. We should not have any conduction in them, but somehow they are they break, right? So they they, they they may enter in the system, but not many, but they may enter in the system, and that is what they become kind of a semiconductors. Okay. So what what we can do um, with 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 um, these semiconductors? So if, if I put um, now a um, little bit chemistry here, okay. So GCSE level chemistry. So if we put pentavalent, meaning that uh, there are five electrons in the shell, uh, we replace that silicon with some um, material. So it can be arsenic or phosphor phosphorus. So so four of electron from this material uh, will able to um, make bond, and one is a kind of loose. So it means that there is an additional electron into the system, so which can enhance uh, its conductivity or reduce its resistivity. So, so the amount what we are to, um, talking about here, uh, it is a probably we begin with a part per 
a million or part per billion. So the, the, the amount we are putting uh, to change the conductivity is the minuscule. It's just so small. Uh, even uh, ordinary instrument can't detect uh, whether you have put this arsenic or phosphorus in it. However, just changing the concentration um, of these dopant, you can change uh, the conductivity. For example, here is the resistivity. So this is 10 raised to power 4. It means it's a very high resistor material. As soon as you start putting these things into it, so you can have a resistivity very close to uh, the metal. So, so, so this is the beauty of semiconductor. So you can change the resistivity a uh, many order of magnitude by the process called doping. Okay, so so that is that is important. So doping is is uh, is good omen for semiconductor, but it can also be curse. The curse in sense uh, which I will be sharing uh, with you, what you mean by curse is that. So if uh, we can control these doping in a precise way, so it means we can predict their resistivity and hence we can ex exploit them making electronic devices. But however, if we cannot uh, control um, uh, these impurities or these uh, unintentional doping, uh, then we are in great trouble. Okay, So that is the reason I will be talking um, about here um, a lot that when we talk about um, semiconductor material uh, where there are a lot of issues, how, how we can deal with those issues. So now um, we produce, apparently if we count um, uh, one transistor, let's say there are trillions of transistors on a, on, a, on a semiconductor chip. So if we count them, I think, and then we say, um, we, we actually produce more transistors uh, than the grain of rice we produce in a, in a total mother earth. Okay, that is the amount uh, of a transistor we produce nowadays. Okay, so now to, to make um, those transistors, so we need to have an industrial process by which we can uh, produce silicon, you know, tons and tons of silicon uh, we, will, we should be able to produce. The process uh, which is used. I think uh, I would like to pay attention on that. So, so this is a kind of a sand, uh, which is silicon dioxide. It is washed, so you can take all the impurities, some of the impurities, not all, away. And then you you um, add a carbon, uh, generally a coke, okay? Um, and uh, you mix this up, just, just mix, uh, and then uh, put it in a furnace. And the temperature, if you raise the temperature of furnace, it's quite high temperature, 1800 degrees centigrade. And then, so what happens? Uh, this oxygen, a simple chemistry oxygen, react with um, carbon and produce carbon dioxide, and you get a very a metallurgical grade silicon. So, so it, I, I tried to show you in my previous slide that the doping or unintentional impurities can uh, lead to a curse means that um, uh, the resistivity, you won't have a control over the resistivity. So it is it is not a very pure silicon. It is still um, very, um, um, some impurities are there. It can have iron and many other things, you know, the natural uh, material uh, mix uh, already uh, present in the sand. They end up um, here in this grade of silicon as well. So then um, uh, it's dissolved in SCL. And you create, create this this uh, trichlorosilane gas, uh, which is quite nasty gas, okay, uh, but it's properly confined. And then um, you use a process called semen process around 900 degrees centigrade. Again, you can notice it is quite a high temperature. So, and then whatever route you take, um, as next step, uh, you can uh, get a uh, grade of silicon, okay? So now what do you mean by different grade? So uh, in semiconductor industries, or if you unfurl the pages of um, any semiconductor um, book, uh, they talk, they say uh, five nine purity, six nine purity, seven nine purity, eight nine purity. So generally a nine uh, and um, a, a purity um, is um, used to make uh, your um, silicon chip or, or the chip in your computer. So it is a, um, very, very pure material, just in, to show you the contrast 
Uh, I'm sure uh, we are aware of gold. When we say gold is um, 24 carat, it is only 99.99% pure. Say. So perhaps rather than saying something is a gold standard, uh, we should probably say a silicon standard. So silicon, perhaps one of the most uh, purest material uh, which is used uh, in, in, in making uh, the chip. Okay. So now this is um, a bit of back of history in the past. Um, I'm sure uh, if you are just like me, done B engine electronics, um, um, and you might have come across uh, some good books, uh, and you may have seen uh, this picture. So these three uh, gentlemen, uh, they uh, invented um, a transistor or so discovered a transistor, say, say, uh, and then uh, I'm sure uh, you know uh, the lot of stories behind it as well. Who uh, invented? Uh, among three. So again, I don't want to indulge uh, in that story, but the beauty of that, they were able to make uh, this very crude transistor. So it is a very crude, it is not made of silicon, and, and it is a germanium-based transistor. However, uh, this uh, pretty crude device uh, changed um, the way we live uh, today. So I had, I was fortunate, uh, I worked very close to uh, this lab when I was in America, and I had the opportunity to actually uh, see this device. So now again, um, then question we can ask uh, when we the first device made um, uh, of germanium, uh, uh, then why silicon um, circuits um, they, they start dominating? So the uh, we can actually from a physics or science point of view, we can also. Uh, put some more argument. I think the main argument one uh, we can, which is the winning one, um, uh, we can put it in is uh, silicon is in abundance. Okay, so it is twenty seven percent of Earth's crust, and germanium um, uh, the material is zero zero point one percent. So this is one thing, and but the silicon offers a very big advantage. So, so when you are going to really make integrated circuit. Um, you, you have trillions and trillions of transistors, millions and trillions of transistors on the chip. So um, we can very easily um, um, uh, deposit or we can grow uh, silicon dioxide on the surface of silicon. And, and that makes our life much easier. But the, the oxide is very stable. Um, you can make oxide on germanium, but it has its own problem. Um, say so. However, on silicon, it is a very stable, uh, and that helps us to make these all integrated circuits. So that is why uh, silicon uh, be became very uh, popular. Okay. So um, yes, just just to want to highlight a few things here. Um, um, so it is a wonderful, uh, you know, in electron. So silicon can be found, you know, in almost um, all. Um, devices now, washing machine to television, to refrigerator computers, okay. So again, if you are working on simulations or any other things or controlling something um, offline, um, so these IC work 24 seven, whether we are sleeping or not, say, so that is um, um, due to silicon and, and it has made a new, huge impact on various fields. Um, I think I, um, I can't want to, I don't want to bore you with um, an exhaustive list, the impact it has uh, on, on various fields. Say so again, um, um, generally we talk about silicon. When we talk about silicon, we generally talk only about IC, but sometimes we forget about its contribution to photovoltaic solar cells. So 90% photovoltaic cells are made of uh, silicon, uh, which are converting energy. Uh, provided sun is out. So we are pretty lucky here in uh, Leicester. It is a very uh, nice day, blue sky, and hence I see a lot of smiley face around me. Say, so, okay, so however, um, now um, I did say all the good thing uh, about um, silicon and, 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 um, and it's the past um, uh, and obviously present. Uh, so so what are the some of the adverse impact? Okay, uh, you know every technology may have some adverse impact as well. So the first uh, slide um, I, I just just want to share with you 
is is something called e-based dump um, in, in in certain countries. So, so uh, you can see that um, the lot of electronics gadget been just dumped, um, and then of course um, um, you know there are a lot of efforts. I think it, it is not that I'm saying, but I think even before I started looking into this field, people are serious and people are concerned that uh, it is creating another. Um, uh, environmental disasters. Hey? So again, um, I, I think uh, we need to um, probably forcefully uh, think that if we want to make silicon as a sustainable material, because it is in abundance, it, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't mean that we keep using and keep and then throwing these dumps somewhere and, and lead to huge uh, environmental and health disasters. Hey? Again, I think uh, um, I read a lot of uh, work and some can be controversial as well. Um, so what I wanted to you know, pick a few things, say, so generally if you say, if you have uh, these kind of uh, cards or electronic um, component, uh, mostly, so first you collect this product, um, disassemble um, and then and, and I think reuse part of it. So for example, if you want to use uh, the chip is still working, you can reuse it, but sometime it can have a lot of con confidential information. So there are uh, some, um, you know, uh, real legal issues there. So uh, again, um, I think so far, um, what I have read, um, when we talk about um, extractions of materials, so generally uh, we extract uh, precious metals such as gold and silver, and then um, can be uh, be often questions can be recycled um, silicon. I think there is always um, sometime a hand waving uh, arguments uh, that um, uh, that generally uh, taken when it's economically uh, appropriate. So, so is it economically viable to recycle uh, silicon? So, I think. Um, uh, I don't want to say much on that. The only thing I would like to say, is it the right approach? So, so you make these devices, millions of these devices, and then we start thinking that is economically viable. So perhaps we think that is environmentally can be disastrous. So I think uh, there um, some uh, thoughts are required. Say, so, okay. So again, um, I think I'm going to bring this slide back. Um, and so I've got 15 minutes, I've covered quite a lot. So, uh, so conventional process, so you, if you see that making, so that is after making silicon devices, so we can, it can lead to certain issues, uh, which I uh, just um, highlighted, so a few of them, there are many more. Um, and then, uh, so when we are extracting as well, so when we are extracting, um, we are extracting, um, consuming huge amount of energy, and, and other resources as well. And then uh, we probably also are uh, leaving a lot of gases into the environment as well. So it is energy intensive process and, and we use, um, you know, uh, coke, um, which will then lead to something which I'll share uh, with you uh, next slide. So um, I um, have come across a <laughs> um, couple of years ago, um, uh, that bringing energy efficiency uh, to fab labs, so where these things are manufactured. So, I, um, so there, what I found in this article, it says semiconductor fab, uh, semiconductor fab industry use a large amount of electricity, in some cases more than auto industry and oil refineries, okay? So um, I was, um, I have to admit on record, so I was completely um, ignorant about this one. And I, I thought um, semiconductor industry is really a very a clean industry, it doesn't contribute that much um, uh, carbon footprint. But again, um, when I read over the last five, six years, so many things. So of course, they are, they are also taking huge steps uh, to improve um, um, the efficacy of their processes as well. But um, um, so, so, but there are uh, still uh, um, um, uh, more work to be done. So, so again, uh, there is a Paris Agreement. So every country, uh, not every, uh, number of countries, are uh, trying to avoid by that uh, 
um, agreement. Right. Now, here is some example which I want to give you because the number always help us. So, to let's say production of one kilogram of polysilicon, which is not a single crystal yet, okay, uh, require 24 kilogram of silica, kind of sand, okay, and consume. Uh, so now, if we just wanted to um, uh, convert that one kilogram of polysilicon uh, to make one called uh, one uh, make one kilogram of polysilicon, and and we we use around 48 kilowatt of electricity. So probably, I mean, I'm not good uh, in baking, but if you're a good baker, so uh, similarly, one kilogram of cake, if you want to make it, it requires 1.5 kilowatt of energy, just, just a comparison, okay? So, and then when we make um, something like this, um, um, it's called in growth, uh, and then, so what happens? So this is useless, the top, okay? And the bottom is also useless. And when we slice this this one to make silicon wafer, clearly like a big, it is a kind of a, a salami cut. So, I, um, so you may when you make slices of these the wafers, so in the same way you use um, a diamond cutter. Uh, so you lose again a material. So this result about 50 percent crystal being wasted. Okay, a further fifty percent remainder is lost during slicing and polishing. And consequently, only about 25% of original single crystal of silicon is effectively used. And, uh, and then uh, for reference, so 27 kilograms of carbon are consumed and 84 kilogram carbon dioxide are emitted for every one kilogram of polycrystalline silicon. So this is um, a carbon footprint. So um uh, making a silicon say again uh, uh burning one liter of gasoline produce, produces approximately around 2.7 kilogram of carbon so you can see that um, just converting silicon dioxide into polycrystalline we have not yet reached a single crystal so we just reach a polycrystalline and that is the amount of energy uh, and carbon footprint it creates say okay so, so, so obviously um, um, there are um, um, issues as such as these I highlighted, uh, and I think these processes um, um, are well developed, I think improved, but um, for the last 60, 70 years, uh, we are using um, quite uh, these, uh, these processes. So, um, are there alternative uh, processes? So uh, this article appeared um, uh, two, uh, two and a half years ago. Um, by Stefan Maldon, Mal, uh, Maldonado. Uh, he was, I think, from University of Michigan. So what he is suggesting, uh, similar to what um, we are talking about, so new chemical approaches are needed to harness and utilize raw, impure, and imminently abundant silica feedstock, um, identifying simpler, more direct chemical and electrochemical silicon dioxide reduction is arguably the most potent carbon dioxide remediation uh, strategy. So I think, uh, so if we want to find remedy or cure of these kind of things, uh, I think uh, um, scientific community required um, a, a, you know, a sincere effort um, to, 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 to uh, to, 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 to reduce the carbon footprint and, and, and create environmentally friendly processes. Okay, so then um, at BMU, uh, we are, uh, I'm going to go uh, quickly through because I have now seven minutes left. So we have um, uh, alternative processes we have developed. Um, and the first, we call it vapor liquid solids that is not developed by us, it is there. Uh, existed, but it's not um, um, explored uh, to make you know certain things. So, for example, solar cell can be made using this process, uh, and then raw process, which is our process, and we are going to talk about that. Okay. So, what happened in VLS process? Um, you take a substrate and put a very thin layer of metals. It can be gold. I think gold, especially a bell explorer, uh, in in making silicon using VLS uh, method. And then you take that um, uh, gold coated, for example, gold coated substrate in a plasma uh, and heat it up and show plasma, it will um, uh, translate into these spherical uh, shapes. And then and what you do, you bring 
a silicon in some kind of a gaseous form. So when um, the silicon uh, will atoms will dissolve in these in this these uh, molten uh, metal sphere. Uh, so it's just like that. If you are putting salt, let's say in a in a water, so after at given temperature and pressure, so you will not be able to dissolve salt uh, more than it can uh, take in at that temperature and pressure in the water, right? So and then what happens? So silicon keep dissolving in it, so it will reach reach the supersaturation, and then it spew out um, generally uh, from the bottom and form these solid structures. So you can make these kind of silicon structures um, around 400 or less um, degree centigrade, okay? So that is called, um, so you are bringing vapor of silicon into this liquid and then this uh, the dissolving liquid and finally form solid. That is why it's called vapor liquid solid uh, growth, okay? So um, yeah, so you can make all these things. So the selection criteria to make this process is a something we call jectective point, basically that, that temperature between metals, but you, you are going to put it in, and silicon. So for example, um, if you use, let's say, gold, generally you will be able to do these structures less than 400 degrees centigrade. So however, if you want to use copper, it means that around 800 degrees centigrade. So however, if you want to use less energy, less temperature, and less energy you are dissipating to the environment, you would like to probably go in this direction. So that is a BLS technique, okay? So, and then we are also uh, invested a lot of time. Um, um, one of my students, now his colleague, Dr. Krishna uh, Manjunatha, uh, who invested a lot of time um, uh, deciphering the various mystery behind this BLS growth. So, so we can uh, choose catalyst um, um, in a in a in a in a um, in a, in, a uh, in a way that it can give us um, a number of advantages. For example, uh, we can choose catalyst uh, which can be self-doped. So we don't have to use dopant from outside. So we have done uh, some of the work and published a couple of years ago um, quite elaborate work. Uh, on BLS uh, growth of silicons uh, as well. Okay, uh, and again, um, you can use uh, these catalysts as self-dope. So it means that you don't need external doping. And um, we again uh, publish um, some work um, in, uh, in 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 a, in a journal. So here, the picture which I'm going to show you here. Uh, this picture is very important. It's the kind of history of uh, making solar cell uh, at DMU. So what you are seeing here uh, is solar cell here, uh, which and the hands of this holy hand, I generally call it, is the Richard, Dr. Richard Cross. And, and then you just shine a light, a simple lamp. It is just a microscope lamp. I just put a substrate, um, it's, it's a silicon solar cell on the top of that, and you see uh, this um, a voltage being produced, it means that it acts as a, a kind of a solar cell. So, so we've done, um, done something, uh, I must say. Yes, okay. So now, again, um, selection of catalyst. Um, so BLS, you know, can give you something, but there are still some issues. So for example, if I want to use antimony or I want to use iron, or titanium or, or titanium or something or nickel for example so the temperature uh, i must use to grow those nanostructure um, should be like if we, uh, for example if you want to use nickel so it should be around 1000 degrees so let's say i want to use nickel but i wanted to make sure my temperature is quite low uh, and that help us uh, to create uh, a process what we call raw process and the raw process um, we do uh, something uh, to the surface of the substrate, aka we put some uh, magic stuff, as we call it, and then um, uh, we can grow these wonderful structures. Uh, we can grow pillars, we can grow a polycrystalline, we can grow spaghetti tie, cacti, uh, we, we try to grow between two electrodes, 
and this is what I call paddy type. So, so uh, numerous um, structures we can um, grow and we can all grow less than 400 degrees centigrade. Even we can use a metal such as nickel or, 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 uh, or titanium or iron or, or various other metal. Uh, and hence, uh, what I'm trying to say that um, um, if you use BLS process, which is not invented by us, um, uh, the energy consumption is still very high if we wanted to use nickel or iron or, or uh, titanium. However, if you use our process, we can um, um, grow these nanostructures. We can still utilize, utilize those metals, uh, but we can grow these structures less than 400 degrees centigrade. So, so um, again, um, I've been asked a lot of questions. Is it BLS process? The likelihood this process is not a BLS process. So we uh, got one patent granted and two patents been published on this process. Okay. So I just want to show you a quick video um, what we do. So this is a thing I wanted to make sure that um, you have best done any particulate in the air. So it's a glass substrate and as a ritual. So you clean these different so on the surface. So you also put in a ultrasonic cater. So these pressure waves take debris attached to the substrate with this magic powder metal solution by different ways, the thin coating or dip coating or um, just you can take a simple uh, paint brush and you can paint on the surface of the substrate that are made magic uh, recipe uh, let's call it magic recipe today and then you will see there's a difference uh, in the color coated and uncoated and once you've done that then you can take it to uh, PCBD where we grow these wonderful silicon structures so it can take up to uh, 10 inch vapor in it so and then and explore idea uh, silicon structures and structures. okay so again, um, I think um, I need uh, to uh, uh, rush through. So the lowest temperature uh, we got um, with this technique in which, uh, by which we can grow these uh, crystalline silicon structure is around 200 degrees centigrade. We can lower the temperature below 200 degrees centigrade, but unfortunately a lot of amorphous uh, silicon is there. So, so I think, um, um, this is this raw process is um, really um, useful. Um, we have done some calculation. So if you want to create a polycrystalline by conventional industrial processes, so if it takes let's say X amount of energy, so the process, the, the raw process needs only one third of that energy. Okay, and it's very high growth rate. So it means that you can uh, deposit the structure in a less time, and and you can also utilize not very expensive substrates such as plastic substrate on which you can deposit. So it can have some economical benefits. And the process is, um, it's not a beaker technology because many times in the university we do something and when, when, then when we want to scale it up and then we can't do anything. So, so what we do, we, we do something to the surface of the substrate and then we use industrial techniques and, and its process is fully scalable. So you can deposit um, um, as big as if you have a, this big chamber or uh, two uh, feet diameter or three feet diameter chamber. So you can deposit uh, silicon structures, uh, crystalline uh, of, of that very dimension. So, and again, uh, compatible uh, with already existing um, um, industrial processes. And we also done some analysis. It reduces manufacturing cost. Okay, so I, as I already said, we have one patent granted and two patents um, actually been published, I think, last year. So, 
Again, um, because our, our main objective is to reduce uh, the, 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 the harmful gases as well as carbon footprint. And I, we believe um, what work we are doing, it does contribute to UN on sustainable development goal or clean energy. Okay, so I think I'm going to a little bit skip through. So I'm just going to give you um, some flavor of uh, things what we, we are doing. Um, so this is a solar cell. This is the university solar cell. This is not manufactured by industry. And, and I think I want you to refer to what you have seen uh, a, um, a, a transistor made in uh, at and and now uh, it's entirely different transistor. So, so at university, we, we demonstrate the concept. Okay, uh, And I think uh, once these concepts are proven and industry can take over and, and, and manufacture, um, uh, um, you know, for example, photovoltaic um, cells. So, so this is university cells. So the idea is to show that it works as a solar cell. So you can create uh, voltage, open circuit voltage and short circuit current. Okay? So if you don't know all these things, uh, don't worry. So what we are tra I'm trying to say that, um, so uh, this one, when no light, when you shine a light, uh, you have uh, some potential, your current is increased. So it means that uh, this very energy you can utilize, okay? So again, you can do some basic combination series and parallel. You can create more current and voltages and these all rudiment work because these, these, these pictures are important for me. Not uh, obviously the solar cell will be important one day, uh, which it will, um, I'll see on the, the roof of the houses, but this is important. This is a history and it should be protected. So again, uh, we were able to make these solar cells on various substrates uh, and they seems to be working. Uh, of course, the efficiency is not that high. Uh, again, a lot of work is required uh, to enhance efficiency. The, 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 the second bit I'm going to quickly go through um, the, the use of silicon. Um, so um, lithium ion batteries, I'm sure you know that um, uh, they are the, probably the best uh, batteries um, uh, it, it, to store uh, energy. So what you have inside the lithium ion battery, you have an anode material, which is generally a graphite or is a carbon. Uh, so it has a lot of porosity. So, so what happened when you, you say you are charging your um, 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 you know, mobile phone or your, uh, or your laptop? So what you are doing, you are borrowing uh, lithium ion uh, from this, this, this um, um, aqueous solutions. So they are going into uh, these uh, porous um, uh, sites uh, and sitting there. So when these porous sites completely filled, uh, and then we call, call it fully charged, okay? So this, this porosity available to store uh, these lithium ions, it is a material dependence, okay? So now if we talk about um, um, carbon, which is currently used, so it can take around 372 of those lithium charge in say, in per gram, okay? Just, uh, um, not necessarily in that way, but but let's 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 take it that, that way. So it can take a certain unit of charge, which is 370 in that that porosity. But silicon, uh, contrary to carbon, silicon take um, 10 times more charge, around 4,000 charges. So it means that um, the battery will last longer. You can store more energy. Uh, but the problem with silicon is this one. So if you focus a uh, volume change, so when these ions goes into carbon, so there is a volume expansion. So, so there's a little expansion. So it's volume expands around 12%. But silicon, it is like a 400% expansion. So, so when you charge, uh, it expands, discharge, it contracts. So this, uh, this, this, this um, expansion and contraction uh, leads to uh, the crack formation in the silicon and finally failure of this battery. So people are suggesting a number of a solution and one of the solution to use silicon is to use its nanostructure. So again, um, yes, uh, it, it, it reduced the issue of pulverizations or this, this reliability, but um, with my very little understanding of science, uh, I think the issue would, will be still be there. Um, uh, maybe it, it can improve, but it, uh, the fundamental issue still be there. So to um, uh, 
Okay, so so to um, so we work um, on something to eliminate that uh, pulverization. So we put a one another patent uh, on this one. So here is a example uh, of a silicon uh, tin silicon anode material, uh, which um, uh, can store um, a four times more energy than the current um, anode material. And, and you can see that um, uh, this is a coin cell manufactured at DMU. So we have facility to manufacture a coin cell and, and it can lit uh, a small LED. Okay. And then the last but not the least, um, I'm just overshooting a few minutes, uh, um, uh, is uh, uh, its use of um, these uh, silicon uh, nanowires um, uh, into electronic uh, memory devices. So if you work on electronic memory devices, you may have come across uh, these kind of ideas. So what is electronic memory? So something is there and something is not there. So it means it is a kind of bistable system. So um, from the science point of view, what we say, if we have a system uh, which uh, swings between two stable states, stable state one and stable state two through a barrier. Okay, so these two states they don't collapse together. Uh, and, and that is how you can create something in memory. So it can be symmetrical uh, towards its energy barrier, or it can be asymmetrical about its energy barrier. So, and then if you have not followed in this picture, you may be seeing your brain trying to uh, find two stable uh, pictures. So, so that is also this picture also a uh, reflection of why stability. Okay, but um, the, the, these are the only mathematical equations I'm going to use in a, in a, in my whole um, in my entire talk. Um, why? Um, I think uh, at DMU with my colleagues, uh, we are working for the last nearly 17, 18 years um, hunting for a memory uh, which can store information and not only much longer period of time. For, because my objective is that can we store information for an infinite time? The reason behind it. So if you think about um, your memory stick, the USB stick, it can't retain the data more than three, four years. It, even you don't use it, uh, it will um, it will start corrupting or disappearing by itself because of some quantum um, issues with it, quantum tunneling issue with it. Say so, so. So I think the idea is to create um, something. Uh, which can be retained for in for a very long period of time. So the only um, um, a gadget which can store information for 50 or 60 odd year are magnetic tapes. It cannot even your hard drive or anything like that. So, so again, uh, these equations tell us a lot of things about the Y stability um, system. Uh, and then when we plot, uh, so this this R is a kind of a key and and X. Uh, can be a some stable states. Um, it can be a ferroelectric domain. It can be a spin of electrons and all those kind of things. Okay, so then when we analyze these mathematical equation further, uh, so uh, if we uh, try to understand uh, this 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 the change um, um, as a uh, let's say as a value of r. So if r is zero, so whatever we get here is unstable. If R is less than zero, still unstable. Uh, and then if R is greater than zero, we get two stable points. So those are, we can explore uh, to um, find the system uh, which can uh, be stable, uh, by stable for a long period of time. So here is a kind of a, an example that, um, and so this is a state zero of your memory and that is state one. If your R is a positive and greater than, obviously greater than zero is a positive. However, if it's less than zero, so you can see the states are separable, but soon they get into chaos. So it means that the, your system is unstable. So you, you will not have the retention of any memory. So why I have shown these kind of equation. So I think at the background, um, um, we do publish a lot of paper on electronic memory devices and all sort of thing. So at the background, these mathematical equations uh, help us to decipher what material we are looking for, what system we are looking for. So I think if we are looking for 
um, something for a longer retention time, let's say in a finite uh, period, um, R is the key uh, to understand. So, so we are kind of working on those things here at DMU. Um, anyway, so uh, here is an example. Uh, one of my PhD student, uh, Konstantin Saranti, who used these silicon nanowires uh, to make um, these memory uh, bistable uh, devices. So here is an example. So you can call uh, this state is zero and this state is one. So it is um, stable uh, for at least for three, four hours. So, so this model, uh, which I developed a long time ago, so we are exploring uh, that very model uh, to make uh, these uh, silicon uh, nanostructure based uh, two terminal uh, memories. Okay. So I think when the first paper was published around eight years ago, eight, nine years ago, I think it was picked up by MRS Bulletin as a news. So, so if you are working in a material um, uh, research, so MRS Bulletin is is a is a is a is a, is a kind of a news bulletin which picked up some of the most topical um, happening around the world. So, so I think uh, we were happy that somebody recognized our work. Right? Okay, so I think um, I'm very close to now wrapping up uh, my talk. So um, there's a lot of um, work been published um, in various forms, book chapters, review articles, um, and then um, organized various conferences where different things were debated, including my model. So it still stands tall. Um, and uh, this is just to um, give you a little flavor of activities and and obviously it is not only me my numerous fellow members uh, they also uh, contribute to that so so i think uh, now you can rest back and a bit relax i'm just going to show you a few slides i'm not going to go through every slide on this one so i'm just going to give you the pictorial views of facilities which we have so we have a lot of fabrication facility uh, built up on over you know 20 um, odd years uh, with external as well as uh, universities um, um, uh, 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 invested um, some money to develop these facilities as well. So and um, yeah, again thin film fabrication facilities. So again, if you know about Dr. Cross, so Dr. Cross is standing here. So this is again uh, a picture which will be a part of the history uh, when it will be told in future. So again, um, these are characterizing facility. We have very advanced characterizing facilities. Um, we can measure current um, sub pico ampere. So if you are working on these advanced electronic devices, so you need these facility. Otherwise, um, uh, it's a difficult um, to comprehend what you're doing. So again, um, we have microscopy, so we can um, like SEM scanning um, um, and scanning electron microscope and also scanning pro microscopes, especially if we wanted to see tiny tiny um, particulate which we work on. So um, again, uh, we have a quite dedicated facility to fabricate a coin cell and, and also test uh, them, um, especially a lithium ion and sodium ion battery. So if you have interest, so please uh, contact us. And then um, as uh, you probably have already gazed or if you have um, understood what I'm saying. Uh, so we have very active research in solar cell as well. So this is solar simulator, um, which is uh, made of um, LEDs. Uh, in the past, solar simulator made of um, certain lamps, which they produce um, heat itself. So sometimes uh, they can affect uh, the characteristics of solar cells. So, so this is, uh, re it is the recently acquired uh, gadget. Uh, it's quite good and, and you can analyze a lot of stuff uh, with this one. And then again, we have uh, many other uh, facilities uh, for characterizations and fabrications. Okay. So again, I think um, what I want to say, um, BLS process, 
um, use multi-process catalysts, but there are still challenges. For example, the precise control of dopant concentration. Um, I think raw process has some answer to it, okay, and it has benefit to it. So, of course, um, I'm open to uh, suggestions, questions, criticism on a raw process. But so far, wherever I present and do this work, and I, I think uh, I think people perhaps nice to me. Most people were very supportive. So we have demonstrated uh, PV using a raw process, uh, which is energy saving process and and less um, um, uh, causing less impact on the environment. Um, and uh, we deposited uh, both on glass. Uh, as well as on a plastic substrate. So now, why I said glass? So it's very difficult to uh, make a by a non, uh, sorry, a, you know, some process to make a crystalline uh, silicon on a glass substrate. So a raw, a raw process can do that. Okay. So then um, I think uh, silicon nanos in the future. I think silicon nanostructure has. Um, um, huge future because this technology is already very mature. For example, next stage of tr uh, transistor at the moment, we are kind of using a similar concept of a transistor. The futuristic idea could be a single electron transistor, but unfortunately, uh, they do not work at room temperature. So you have to pour a bit of cryogenic liquid to make sure they can work. So, however, uh, there are this is exploratory field, so perhaps we people can look into that and then our people are looking into it say uh, and then um, uh, if you want to capture most of the energy coming from sun it coming from a different we're coming with a different wavelength so we can then tailor these nanostructure in such a way we can change the band gap of these structures so that we can capture almost all the photons so if you are able to do that it means that perhaps uh, the efficiency of solar cell uh, will be much higher. And then again, um, silicon is, is a quite a promising material to store electrical energy. Uh, and, and I think we will continue this work with, with, with zeal. So that is what um, we are doing anyway. So, and then um, I think um, for the last um, one or odd year, so we are also exploring silicon uh, nano wires into new neuromorphic memory. So I think neuromorphic memory is going to be an integral part of future AI or anything related with that. So I, so I think uh, we got some idea, we have tested that. So we are currently uh, exploring those ideas. So I, and then uh, I think um, another thing, we must look for less energy intensive and, and environmentally uh, uh, friendly, the word friendly is missing, processes. Uh, for manufacturing semiconductor material. I think um, silicon changed our life. I think um, I'm, I'm, you're listening to me through it. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, in my uh, fish pond at my home, uh, it was run by now probably by solar uh, cells. And, and so there are lo so a lot of advantages, but there are some of those issues, uh, environmental issues and, and energy intensive issues, which I've shown that that silicon um, uh, causing. So maybe uh, we need to go to blackboard, uh, you know, back to the board uh, and, and start jotting out are there other processes um, can be, uh, you know, incorporate uh, into uh, manufacturing and next generation devices. I think that is um, uh, easy to say, and difficult to uh, adopt, say. And then again, recycling silicon. So you have already created this, you know, uh, better than gold standard silicon. And then we don't recycle um, it. So um, is this economically viability argument is the right approach? I leave it with you. So again, um, I need to say thank you uh, to various uh, funders. And then finally, I have to acknowledge our people who were involved or who are involved as well in this work. And uh, thank you for your attention. And here is my contact. Thank you, Professor, for that uh, silicon standard lecture.
<laughs> we learned a lot from you on silicon um we do have a few questions mm -hmm. i want to start off with one on supply chain mm. so when the covid 19 pandemic hit the silicon supply chain was interrupted leading to knock-on effects that disrupted many industries. If silicon is the second most abundant material on our Earth's crust, why is there a dependence on sourcing them from specific countries only, like China and Russia? I think, uh, um, as I said, um, uh, there are, I think, few um, answers. I can only give the scientific answer to it not the, the political or diplomatic answer. Um, when I said that um, most of the silicon is ex extracted uh, from sand, yes. And uh, I want to move, bring this uh, here, yeah, so that I can see. Okay, so most of the silicon is extracted from sand. And, and I think uh, uh, the sand uh, is not all the sand, what we see on beaches or other places is actually uh, usable. It has a lot of impurity. So it means that we can't just um, uh, take that very sand and convert into silicon. So but then it will become much more energy intensive. Uh, and, and I think uh, the new. So, so I think my understanding is that generally this sand is mined. OK. And those mines are in certain countries which has, you know, kind of, let's say, relatively pure sand. OK. Uh, and um, I think this could be the one reason. Another reason could be that many, uh, you know, th there is a shortage of supply, right? So, so uh, that is what we said during COVID period because it would be required silicon chain. But then many countries also realize that, so they have to, you know, pull their socks up and start manufacturing. So, so if, uh, so there is not enough um, uh, industry which can actually uh, create um, a silicon, um, uh, you know, electronic grade silicon, uh, what we require. So there is a mismatch between demand and supply. So now people recognize that. I think uh, even a country of, um, of my words, <laughs> uh, they are investing a lot of money um, uh, in basically to make um, um, silicon in gold or silicon uh, of, of uh, electronic grades. So there may be some political things which I don't want to uh, touch upon. Okay, so you do think that it has to do with the distribution of uh, uh, a better grade silic silicon or silica around the world? Yeah, I think distributed and known. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that other country may not have that. It, is it, it maybe it is a buried somewhere. So. So, but it is known that, and I think in also in America and some part of in Europe, that sand is, we call it clean sand. It has very less impurity and hence that the process is not that energy intensive. And, and uh, it, it, is, it is a very energy intensive process to get this 99 pure, pure silicon. Okay, that's good because the second question has to do with this uh, high intensity yeah, energy the high intensive, highly intensive uh, energy consumption for the fabrication. The second question is about the silicon chips not being biodegradable and their fabrication is detrimental to the environment with increasing reliance on silicon chips in general since we produce more transistors than there are grains of rice. I think I caught that also from your talk. What is your recommendation on how we manage these e-waste? I think uh, like at the end of my talk, I said that um, to recycle silicon, I think um, to make silicon from sand of that high purity, we already invested a lot of energy, right? So then um, we just dump these these chips somewhere and and the only thing we extract gold and silver because it can be easily extracted right and then we let uh, in, in the fate of the environment whatever happened we, we probably don't care but i personally feel that um there will be, there should be uh, a political will like you know we process that like for example um like one of the article i have written that um, 
uh, when you make these kind of a devices, we should also have a process, not, not only just take the outer part of the uh, electronic circuit board, but what is inside the chip, we should be able to recycle it. And so I know there are like a lot of upheaval to recycle uh, silicon, uh, but uh, is, is environmental disaster is, uh, uh, is, is not that important as, as money we have, uh, to, 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 to the funds we are going to invest. I think the right approach should be that uh, um, even it is in abundance, silicon, as I said in my talk, it is in abundance, so it's a 27%. We should not keep uh, also raping Mother Earth that keep digging up this sand from you know, different mines and, and making these, and then we, we just um, don't recycle it. I think uh, there should be uh, a clear um, path uh, or pathways uh, to recycle uh, these chips and, 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 and uh, you know, extract as much as silicon and reuse, it, reuse them, whatever, um, the, whatever the cost is. I think saving the, the saving the environment. I think uh, uh, how to say um, saving Mother Earth is is is, is, is should be the priority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We may not see now, but I think as our I'm not saying that. I think nowadays we can't live without these gadgets. I think um, as the, the questioner asked, as we, I think. Um, in the beginning, uh, people said that we don't need. To, okay, let's let's go back uh, to my PhD level 20 years ago. When I was doing PhD, uh, we had among 10 students, we have only one computer. Okay. Now each PhD student has that more than one computer. Sometimes I feel that yes, okay. Mm -hmm. So everybody is using these these gadgets, or maybe if we want to use these gadgets if, if, with these numbers, I personally feel that we should be. We should have a clear plan, clear guideline. Maybe government of each country should intervene in this one. Uh, maybe it's a part should be the part of policy that we would like to extract silicon as much as possible, uh, rather than throwing into the environment. And that will also stop mining because that can also have a bigger impact on the environment. Hmm. That's definitely something to look into. Uh, 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 the next question is about the lifespan of silicon chips. So silicon chips do not have moving parts, but they have finite lifespans. So they do seem to go through some form of wear and tear. And it is also said that the lifespan of silicon chips is reducing. Okay. Why is this so? Okay, so I think... Uh, um, The number of, um, I think I can address this question in a number of ways. <laughs> so, so when, um, let's say, um, let's say, let's take a memory chip, kind of, yes, okay, so made of silicon. So you write, um, you take your picture, yes, you put your picture onto the chip, yes, so it is sitting there, and then you want to see it, you're accessing it, yes. So now, when you are writing and reading, and writing and reading, um, then, then what happens that um, the materials um, um, has some kind of reliability issues. So those reliability issues uh, are time dependent as well. So as you are accessing uh, the, any single device a uh, number of times, so there are uh, some uh, thermal di uh, dissipations. So those thermal dissipation uh, can uh, cause um, damage and that damage will lead to failure of a chip, okay? But what, what happens in, especially in a, let's say, silicon memory, so um, if uh, generally there is a redundancy um, um, idea um, there, so even if one, let's say, um, uh, one pixel is taken care of by like three or four transistors, so even if one transistor fail, other two or three transistors will take care of that, but then if the four fails, then they are not, okay? So. So now uh, the, the second bit of the question, so it means that when we are accessing uh, the information, so we are passing, uh, we are applying electric field and we are passing current. And when we are passing current, uh, there will always be going to be a dual heating. Dual heating means that um, natural system will heat up, right? And then um, as uh, we are 
um, using again and again, that heat um, can damage certain tracks or certain devices, and hence uh, the chip becomes redundant. So the second bit uh, asks that the lifespan becoming shorter of the chip. So, so um, the what is happening with, with the chip at the moment? So, so if you think about our chip, so we have um, gate uh, and source and drain. So this is a kind of transistor structure. So the distance, physical distance between source and drain is called gate. Okay. So earlier, the gate, when it was probably in 70s, when it was quite big, it is in a micron size. So as the gate is been reduced, so it is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And your the gate thickness, the oxide thickness is also becoming smaller and smaller. So, so it means that um, uh, that everything is now con the large number of transistors are confining in a very small area. Okay, so it means that um, a, a, the, let's say there are twenty transistors sitting here. So you have a local heating here in a very tiny area. They can actually impact on other transistor as well, and that is one of the reason. And also. Uh, when we are reducing the thickness of the, the top of the insulating layer, that also causes uh, some of the tunneling current that can also damage the chip. So, so yeah, so I think generally in um, semiconductor chip industry, you come is something called trade-off. Yeah. So, and uh, so you want to have, you know, um, a laptop which you can on palm top, tiny device, right? Uh, but um, uh, you you can't use big transistors. So I'm sure some of you may remember that earlier computer were very bulky and big. Okay, but now um, I think trillions of transistors can we put it on uh, the size of my nail? Yes, this happened because of the miniaturization. So miniaturization has advantage, but disadvantages as well. So the local heating can cause these issues. So. Uh the trade-off is between the size and its reliability, the reliability of the device itself. Yes, I think reliability is still a very big issue associated with these devices. And uh, even like even a large area, there was a reliability issue. But now I think it's so more important because um, now the devices, large number of devices are packed in a very small areas. And I think um, the reliability issues um, comes like if I really, really want to go deeper into the science. <laughs> so, is one of um, the the issue is called um, hot carrier damage. Uh, so, what do those hot carriers are? So, somehow by um, when we apply electric field uh, to um, the transistor gate or source and drain, uh, some percentage of carrier electron carrier they they attain energy uh in like uh, i don't know if you, uh, some of you know the unit of energy especially using semiconductor like 10 or 8 electron volt so if you translate that um energy into temperature that temperature will be more than uh, temperature of sun surface okay so they are there they exist there so um when uh, we are uh, um, I'm not saying that is the only one. That is one of the issues. So we are confining these, you know, the tiny transistor, which are less than 35 nanometer. I think it's now 38 nanometer technology or less. Um, so, so they can cause local heating and damage those devices as well. Okay. But um, then again, um, uh, people are finding some way out to reduce it. Uh, but I think it is a necessary evil. Uh, we have learned how to live with it. So even uh, our chip lifespan is shorter, uh, but it gives the other benefit. Uh, so 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 that so that's it. Okay. So do you think that we would hit a, a, a saturation point in terms of how small we're going to make it? <laughs> yeah, I think this question I set in my to, to my master degree students. I uh, I think um um. We already hit, uh, so, so earlier it was a planar technology. Uh, planar technology means that um, your source and drains are already in one plane, okay? 
So, um, and then you, like, let's say you, you keep reducing the distance between source and drains or something like that. Yes. So now that is a physical distance, right? But then uh, the when the channel form in the uh, in the transistor, there is electrical distance, and that electrical distance is always smaller than the physical distance. Okay. So now, uh, so if you keep reducing this distance, it means that at certain distance, the electrical resistance, sorry, electrical distance in which that channel form that may disappear. Even you have a physical distance, but you may not have the channel formation at all. If there is no channel formation, there is no transistor action. So that is one thing. Another is the quantum uh, phenomena. So quantum phenomena, we, we say that. So if we are bringing, uh, let's say, source and drain closer and closer and closer and closer into like the sub nano or something like this. So what happens that, uh, you know, the, the probability of electrons sitting, let's say here, let's, let's say sort of, you know, hypothetical thing and here, uh, there will be a finite probability. So it means that you do not have a proper control over the channel. To, to eliminate that, I think Intel now um, actually manufactures is called 3D transistor. Okay. So they know more. They're still made of silicon. I don't think they use silicon dioxide and insulator. So they are something in this shape. Okay. So you still have a big electrical length let's say in a crude way to put it. Uh, uh, and then uh, there is no, uh, you know, disappearance of the channel length. Okay. So the question you're asking that, can we further that this keep reducing and reducing? So now we are in the 3D transistor, so right? So um, I'm sure there will be dead end one day with the current technology. So cleaner technology, now we change into 3D technology, right? And there may be, but there are other exploratory materials coming up, for example, graphene as well, um, which is a slightly different concept. And like, for example, single electron transistor, which, which I just highlighted. Uh, but the problem with those things, uh, you can make of silicon, people have made those. But the problem with those transistors, so they only work at quite low temperature. Uh, at room temperature, you need to have a certain dimension to make them work. The noise level is really high. All right, that's interesting. Um, there's one question here on silicon itself. If somehow silicon did not exist, would we have computers? Yeah, I think uh, uh, we had computers. If you unfold the, pa uh, the, the pages of history, um, I think um, I'm, I'm sure uh, the gentleman or the, the lady or the person who asked this question he, he may know about uh, Alan Turing, uh, and and we have a, a, a display in Bletchley Park. So without, um, you know, computer means that to solve logically some problem, right? So you give that. I mean, not the computer in the form, but you are today, they were not, but there were the machines were built um, in around Second World War in Bletchley Park, which can resolve these issues, which were not a silicon based and uh, um, even television and radio uh, existed which were not um, a silicon based they were thermionic tube based so people built um, even a computer uh, with with thermionic valves as well but they are very bulky uh, they create a lot of heat winter is okay but if it is hot then you are all you 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 you, you don't want to work in that that room where the, those computers are sitting yes um, yeah Mm -hmm. I mean, it's possible, it's just a logic on and off. Basically, you can use simple switch, mechanical switch to make computers. Right. right. All right. Uh, the last question is from an anonymous audience seeking um, opportunities at DMU. Um, so this person is talking about spiking neutral networks, SNN which has low energy consumption compared to classic neutral networks. And it is sustainable for implementing computation in memory. Are there any lab facilities at DMU that are suitable to do research on chips for SNN? I think um, um, I've gone through uh, 
quickly about the facilities, right? So we, uh, I think, it, it, we we do develop um, some electronic devices, rudiment devices. Uh, basically, what we call is exploratory devices to into um, to demonstrate uh, the phenomena, for example. So we have those facility. So uh, the person, uh, you know, I, I encourage him or her to contact me and and let me understand exactly uh, what uh, his or her plans are uh, what kind of material what kind of dimension he is looking for so we have we can then say yes or no but i do we do make memory devices we do test them uh, and uh, and and in fact uh, we are also uh, exploring um, similar uh, idea what he or she mentioned in his question so so the best thing is that um, contact me uh, by email and we can have a chat what is because just from the questions I can't fathom exactly um, uh, what um, uh, uh, he's or she is looking for all right it's fair thank you professor thank you for your time uh, and for your lecture today I think um, silicon is a very interesting material for sure and which much with much potential to explore I want to thank also the audience who have attended the, the lecture session. I hope you have also benefited from this. Thank you, everyone. And good night. OK, thank you. And thank you very much. And good night or uh, good afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Bye. Bye-bye.